Welcome in. Welcome into the Buy Me Podcast. Going to be a fun one today. Always my favorite part of the week. I don't know if I can say the same for these other three guys. they got some great lives as they're living, but uh, always my favorite part of the week. Hope it is yours as well. If you're subscribed to the Bite Me Podcast, we appreciate it. If you're not, wherever you get your podcast, you can subscribe to the Bite Me Podcast. And, of course, Facebook group page, 98 plus now. We're bearing down on 10,000, uh, and uh, so we'll get there here pretty soon if you want to join uh, the Bite Me group page. And, of course, this YouTube channel. You can join us live every Every Tuesday at 3.30 p.m., thereabouts. We're about seven minutes late today, but that usually happens uh, uh, when we get started, everybody getting situated. Uh, but uh, let's dig in, man. I'm John Lopez. Captain Dean Thomas is uh, at, at the old ranch today. He's got some uh, some nice mounts behind him. Uh, Captain Scott doing his deal uh, over at the back porch ranch, his ranch. And Captain Caleb McCumber, uh, who was a lot of fun uh, to be on the boat with uh, this past weekend, uh, with uh, our auction winners uh, is at his abode uh, near Needville or in are you technically in Needville? I'm in Fairchild. It's a little little farming community. That's what I thought. Yeah, yeah that's what I thought. Uh, well, let's dig dig in. We're gonna we're gonna talk a lot uh, just so people can uh, know what's coming. Uh, the trout changes here. We're gonna talk about that in detail. Uh, artificial lure bites. That's a question we got from uh, a listener. Uh, what you need to know if you really want to tarpon. Uh, Scott, you may want to start thinking about that now because I don't know anything you and Dean. Um, desal plants, what are they? We'll get to that. And uh, something that came up on the boat uh, with uh, Dean this weekend that I thought was a really good topic that we could dig into. But let's start with the weekend that was, the week that was. Um, we've talked about the feeding frenzy, which we have, uh, uh, well, we had last year and we're going to have again this year. Uh, we're digging in on uh, where exactly we want we want to have it. It might be a, a little twist, might be a little surprise for you people. Maybe even come right off the water and join us at the feeding frenzy. We'll get you details on that ASAP. Um, but we were out on the water. Uh, on one boat was uh, Captain Dean, Captain Scott, uh, Mike Ashworth, and Austin, who was part of the group that was uh, on the uh, that that bid the highest for the trip to go with us. And then on our boat was Captain Caleb, and I want to get to some of that, by the way. Uh, and, of course, uh, uh, Justin and Michelle, who bid uh, on uh, that trip with us. And uh, we had a blast. But there's always a couple stories here and there. And let's start right there. Uh, thoughts? And I, I put this very vague, and I'll give mine first so you guys can get a good uh, feel for what we're looking at here. By the way, thanks for joining us. If you are live with us, we, we see your comments, and uh, we can follow up if you have anything else on what we're talking about. I put it very vague. I said, thoughts and observations from the day on the water, dot, 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 with each other. Uh, and so I know we had some uh, some stuff going on on both boats. There was uh, allegations of pot licking coming from both sides. There was uh, all kinds of uh, stuff going on uh, there. But I'm going to start it, like just little things you pick up on. It was fun. It was a blast. It was very smooth, uh, which was uh, no 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 real issues or problems uh, anywhere that I saw. Maybe you guys can correct me on that. But uh, I had some observations, you know, as I'm uh, as I'm leaving, uh, going back uh, to my place down there uh, in in Aransas Pass. I'm like, I was I was thinking that was a blast and uh, that was a lot of fun. But I did have some some things that kind of made me laugh a little bit. The first one, and we talked about this briefly. I put it a post on Facebook is like just last week we were talking about uh, topwater hook sets and, uh, you know, do this, don't, don't do that. Uh, it can change. It can do this. And lo and behold, Captain Scott, Captain Scott, the master of all, uh, set a hook by allowing the redfish to swallow the swallow, mind you, the <laughs> topwater, digest it, maybe even have an after dinner mint, uh, and, and it went all the way down to his lower intestine before he decided to set the hook. Uh, I mean, this was, and there's, by the way, there's a follow-up on that that happened at the dock later, but Scott, uh, man, come on. Uh, you know, you got to take your own advice. You know it. It's it <laughs> a whole new meaning to tell hook. <laughs> yes, he, You're starting he to sound like Landry him. now. <laughs> man. He tail hooked, he tail -hooked from the just, inside out. Like, that just goes to show that Scott's been listening to us. <laughs> on you know when that top water hits to have to wait to be patient oh he waited <laughs> i'm very patient <laughs> oh he definitely waited Man, john i mean you putting things on me like landry put stuff on you that ain't right i don't know maybe i am maybe i'm exaggerating just a little bit uh, i think it was, it, was out the, uh, it was squirting out the back end when we uh netted it <laughs> 
explain yourself, nah, man. Scott. Just like we talked about, they redfish come up and they blow up on the top water and they take it underwater, but they don't get hooked. That's exactly what yeah. he did. Blew it up, <laughs> took it underwater, it disappeared. It was big swirl, and hell, Mike Ashworth was standing right next to me. He saw the whole thing. It pulled it under, so I was waiting for it to float back to the top. And usually, you know, once they do that, it floats back to the top, pops back up like a cork, like John's used to, and then you twitch it <laughs> once or twice. And the redfish comes right back and eats it again. Well, it never made it back to the top, and it thumped it. I mean, like a 10-pound trout hitting a corky, man. I mean, this thing just smacked the hell out of it. I took the rod out of my hands. So I start fighting and get it in there, and I'm looking at it on the way in. I'm like, man, where's my lure at? <laughs> that redfish <laughs> absolutely inhaled that thing. It ate mm -hmm. it underwater. I've never had a topwater bite underwater. That was kind of cool. It's a little different. <laughs> so we tried to perform surgery on it and there wasn't no, there wasn't no getting it back. So yeah, we even tried to, you know, we were trying to come in through the gills. Just if I just said down to hell with it, cut it off and yeah. we chunked that one in the cooler. And then at the dock and Captain Dean had, and Captain Dean had a great and, idea. And as we, as we threw it in the cooler, Dean said, yeah, I'll just get this one back when I clean it. Yeah. So we're back at the dock and we're doing our thing. I'm kind of piddling around the boat, picking trash up out of the boat and doing stuff. And Dean gets his knife out and he's over there and he fillets this thing out all nice. And he's standing there and he looks over at me, got his fillet knife, he all skins it off, takes that head with his left hand and just tosses it right in the water, <laughs> skin flaps and head, backbone. And I watch it as it's sinking down. I said, uh, what were you doing? He goes, he said, what do you mean? Why did you, why did you do that? I said, why'd you, why'd you just do that? And he said, what? Do you want the, you want the head for something? It's fine. I was like, what, what are we? We're going to make some bone soup or something? <laughs> I said, well, I mean, I, I thought the plan was to get my lure out of his mouth. Yeah, it was. And then he just stopped and stared at me. <laughs> oh, yeah. We, we did plan that, didn't we? No, I didn't yeah, even, the look I mean, on Dean's face was awesome. Happened. Yeah, he looks at when he says, why did you do that? I thought I threw the fillets in. I thought I threw the wrong piece in. I looked all around the table trying to figure out what I did. And then he goes. I was just watching this, my lures slowly said, sink to the bottom. Yeah. He said, you were supposed to cut my lure out of there. And I was like, dang, I was. <laughs> so we just watched $10 sink to the bottom. Yeah, yeah. And just then the he got his part. cast net out, and he got his cast net out, and said, "I'm, I'll get it." <laughs> How'd that go, Dean? Caught a hard head. cast net for it. Caught a hard head. <laughs> so it tangled up in the net. <laughs> Didn't have the lure. Didn't have. <laughs> so yeah, so yeah. After the net got destroyed, we're looking at about you know a fifty dollar turnaround there, real yeah, real yeah. quick. <laughs> go ahead, Caleb. He's just trying to feed his family, man. <laughs> I don't know oh, if, if I if I learned anything it was if you're going to be on John's boat and invariably the fishing is going to be a little bit slower at least get on the boat with the chick with yoga pants as okay well. and then have and then for some reason have Scott bitch about it when we drift beside him okay hold on for a second first of all we had plenty of opportunities I posted a video of a nice double hookup uh, that uh, these people uh, these fine friends uh, failed to, to land. So that's not on the captain. Secondly, that was my second observation, Caleb. So I'll let you have next swipe at your observations. Uh, after I say this, I got to give you a lot of credit. Like I, I I'm like hand of God, like serious credit. Everybody listen up. We were on the boat for what? Six, Doesn't happen seven often. We, we, we were on the boat for six or seven hours for the duration of the six or seven hours. Caleb was working every angle he could possibly work from one side, from the other side, doing it in subtle ways, doing it in not so subtle ways to get the lovely Michelle to get into her bikini, which was underneath her clothes. I'm and a content creator, man. This and, is and, 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 and I'll be damned if it didn't work in the last hour. <laughs> he was you trying know, the, everything. About 90% of my living is made off of me making content to put on the interwebs <laughs> and... That's a surefire way to get put on the interwebs. 
All right. This is what we do. I mean, you're not wrong. But I was like, I was like thinking to myself, Caleb, she ain't going to do it. She ain't going to do it. Not with us two idiots on the boat. I'll be damned. Yes, she did. <laughs> yeah. all, all it takes is a little bit of peer pressure, peer pressure and a little bit of solar persuasion. And about seven hours. <laughs> it did it, 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 it didn't hurt. I could, if I could have got her on the, the bandwagon as her husband and having a beer and we're putting out with it, it probably would have got it done a little quicker. Hell, she brought vodka. She did. You're right. You're right she, she brought did. vodka on the boat. <laughs> How about that? That's pretty strong. And it still hey, took uh, seven hours. See, y'all are freaks. <laughs> <laughs> well, John kept talking about stiff and quick, and they kept just throwing shit off, man. Hey, hey, my hat was perfect all day long. <laughs> I don't care if I was running 35. Just boom. Just perfect the, the whole time. Uh, so it was, it was fun. I don't know. I don't know if you guys have anything Just jump in, uh, in terms of uh, observations. Uh, obviously we didn't spend a lot of time. We we're around you guys on the other boat a lot. Um, but we didn't spend a lot, any time on, on your boat. Uh, any observations from, uh, uh, the rest of you guys on, on the great day. And by the way, we will do that again this year at the feeding frenzy. And I was, I was quite pleased with what we caught on my boat compared to the previous four days. Mm -hmm. So the days you know those guys awesome contribution to the um to the texas boys you know they bought the trip for mm -hmm. a really good uh donation a pretty substantial amount of money and those are the guys you really want to catch a fish and have a good time and i was stressing all week man it was tough and then the day that it mattered we, we caught a few fish so um it, i was i was pleased with the performance but i just had a ship of fools with me that day. So, <laughs> the fact that uh, the you quit fact talking that we about Austin that anything way. <laughs> with what was going on is, you know, hey, even a blind squirrel gets the nut sometimes. And I think I think Justin's observation was don't let Michelle have vodka until after the live auction. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> yeah, we're gonna, yeah, we're gonna sell some trips at the next one. It's vodka for everybody. <laughs> Vodka for everybody. And uh, Justin here on the live stream says, uh, Caleb, that's called the long game you were playing. Uh, I've been playing it for 42 <laughs> years, John. <laughs> I, uh, seriously, I, though. Uh, I know, I I'm not. I know, you look at the look at this, this mug in front of you. I'm not a short game guy. <laughs> Never have been. Uh, Scott, I don't know if you have anything, but I was just telling myself like over and over, he's trying that again, isn't he? He's trying to do that again, isn't he? <laughs> I did, about, the, about 10 All I know I is, to set my pole down and, and said, I got a new, new something to fish for. <laughs> Even when the fog rolled in, I knew exactly where y'all were. I mean, it got heavy fog. I knew exactly where y'all were. I could, all I could hear was Caleb talking and you laughing. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, so it was like radar. Pretty much. Yeah, Pretty and vice much. versa. All I could, I could tell where y'all are at because I could hear y'all fighting fish and saying that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> It was pretty good. Oh, oh boy. Uh, I, almost, no, I, was, I almost screwed up. I almost caught a fish on the first cast. I, mean, I, I, I saw threw out. I mean, as soon as we rolled up, I, I throw out there and that sucker blows up on it. I'm thinking, no, not the first cast. Not the first cast. That's, that's my one superstition of all my superstitions. Yeah, you talked about it. Yeah, all these fishermen's superstitions and all this stuff and the bananas and all that, I don't believe in. That first fish on the first cast, man, I hate that. So I, I did on the put a video cast. of this on the Facebook page for those of y'all that haven't seen it. Yeah, there is. And and by the way, that was another observation I had on our boat. Mike was on y'all's boat. And I told Caleb a couple of times, Mike sure is doing a lot of fishing. I don't know how much video he's going to be getting today. He's like, yeah, I'll go. I'll take the video. <laughs> sure. Sure you will. Um, but no, it was it was a really good time. Uh, enough action uh, to, to, to keep everybody happy. And, uh, and enough. Uh, pot licking from from our other guys uh that were there uh, i don't know right, man so, we got in and all all john kept doing was apologizing for how slow it was and me and dean are looking at well each other, man we caught fish i don't know what they're no no was. we we had enough uh, we had enough action i was i had higher expectations i wanted to really because they paid so much i wanted to really put them on on a big time bite and it was good early and then it was bad and then uh it was a uh, small trout at the end but uh I was all about like, all right, these, these are great people. Uh, they have a great, uh, you know, company in, in, in uh, Brian College Station, uh, Coastal Addiction, by the way. Uh, shout out to them. 
Um, and we had, and we got the tease of a couple of redfish early. I caught one. I think Caleb caught one. They had the two double hook up, and uh, and then we kind of kind of slowed down after that. But no, it was it was good. It was, it was a lot of fun. I, you, I, keep, it was, you keep leaving Austin out, man. You, you keep talking about Justin and Michelle. No, I said Austin at the Austin. start. <laughs> yeah, I said Austin at the start. Uh, how did he do? He's a good dude. He's a good dude. We had a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Of course, he, well, he, he's, uh, he's of course, he had to go over hard, hardcore wade guy. So he was kind of adapting his skills to boat fishing, um, mm -hmm. and really amongst yeah three other people that were kind of crowding up the areas. But yeah, those guys <laughs> that like exclusively jump out of the boat and walk, and we were drifting on the troll motor and such. But yeah, Justin was a cool dude, man. Uh, fun fishing mm -hmm. with him. And one uh, of the Jordan funniest says, bites of the day was. Well, one of the funniest bites of the day was Austin was working his top water and he got a blow up and Dean sniped him with a soft plastic. It was <laughs> Caleb did some sniping. Hey, he hey, threw Caleb it right behind on, it. On your boat, he did some sniping trying to get you and uh, Austin's lure got in the way. And we had a, a mid-air collision. <laughs> had a mid-air collision on that. Yeah, I mean, when, when you're hooking lures from the other boat, you, it's I'm congested. The audio on the speakers where at least you have something to listen to, but it ain't working. It's it's congested. <laughs> and Jordan says, if I wanted them to catch fish, uh, then why did you put them on your boat? Because I'm good. And by the way, they chose the boat. Well, actually, Scott was on the other boat first, so I guess they, they came over to ours. Um, all right. So on to some, some, uh, some topics here. Uh, it's here, Scott. I'm going to start with you, man. Uh, and, then, uh, and then we'll get to your guys' observations on this. Uh, the trout limit change is here. Here's where I want to go with it, though. Uh, obviously whatever observation you have on that and thoughts, but what's the impact going to be? Is it going to be apples to apples? Like with uh, redfish, is it going to be, um, you know, what's the fishery going to look like in two years or five years or 10 years? And then uh, the ever important question of, will it ever, will it ever get, get back? Uh, let me mute uh, Caleb because he's, uh, talking over things. I think having some audio issues. Uh, so Caleb has been muted. Um, but Scott, like, what's it going to look like? Is it going to be the same? Is it going to be different? What do you think? Man, talk about the long game. Uh, I think long term, I think it'll help. Uh, short term, who knows, man. It, it really helped down south when they did the emergency regulations right off the bat and right after the freeze. And they were basically real similar to what we ended up with here as a permanent fix. Uh, their fishery has bounced back pretty damn good down there from what I'm seeing from everybody. I'm talking to Wayne and uh, Caleb was just down there and saw all of it. Uh, hopefully that translates and everything picks up everywhere else. Um, and I hate to go there, but until we get something done with the croaker stuff, you know, I, I think that's the next step of improving the fishery. Although I'm kind of, kind of, kind of leaning towards maybe that this this regulation with this you know narrow slot and three fish that possibly the the croaker soaking won't uh, won't be near as popular. We'll see. And that's exactly what I was thinking. With um, in the short term, it's probably going to be. I, I mean, it's. I think my first in intuition is that in the short term, it's going to be the same, but those bigger trout that were going to be thrown in a cooler are going back in the water now. So it may have a quicker effect than, than we're thinking, you know, time will tell how that goes on, but uh, I'm interested to see how it affects the croaker industry and the croaker guys that go out there, you know, with the intentions of getting those trout. I mean, see, they're going to get three trout and they're going to be done. You know, um, mm -hmm. it's going to have a good effect on it. I mean, I, I the fact that those, anything over 20 inches is going back in the water, it's pretty damn amazing if you're trying to make a, a large trout fishery. I Trust me, I understand the, there's going to be a lot of resistance not really resistance because you can't keep them i mean you got to put them back but there's going to yeah. be a lot of um there's a lot, a lot of bad feelings about it but you know 
So here's what's great. So when the trial limit went from 10 to five, there were people who screamed bloody murder way worse than five to three. Whenever it went from 10 to five, you're going to put us out of business. I mean, it was just death threats. And the, immediately the results were there with better, more, bigger fish. And then after two or three years, you couldn't find one person who would say anything bad. All the people that were against it wouldn't admit that they were against it three years ago. They mm -hmm. changed their tune real quick. So hopefully, um, you know, in two to three years, when everybody is catching some quality trout in good numbers uh, and catch and release kind of catches on across the board, all of those naysayers will be singing another tune. See, Caleb, this is where I, mean, I know a bunch of people who've got real. But I know a bunch of people who got really upset, like Dean was talking about, and then now it's five. Several years later, they're going, "Man, I wish we had done that sooner." <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, and they're swearing they so, were for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. So, Caleb, here, here's where I am with this, and I think you might fall in the same boat, so to speak. Um, I'm looking forward to catching some really, really big trout, and I think the odds are going, you know, uh, astronomically higher in the next two to five years. No, oh, God. Yeah, it's uh. No, God, please, no, no. You know, I like I like to catch a bunch no. of Philip the Thuler, um, trying to feed my family and all that stuff. Uh, I'm lucky enough that I I get to travel to places where it's still pretty decent, and you know, trust us, it's fun to go catch big ones. Uh, you look at the you look at back in the '80s when the redfish were almost decimated, and they made changes there, and now one of the most common arguments is. We need to catch more redfish, need to keep, keep more redfish. So like Dean said, maybe in the short game, you won't see a lot of it. But in the long game, you know, hopefully it helps and picks up and gets more people back in the trout game. I would like to see a lot more trout fishermen out there. Uh, well, I think it gets more people in the trout game. I think you have a, your odds go up of catching big trout just by default. You can't keep anything over 20. Uh, and then I also think, uh, you know, I, I also think that because you're only keeping three, and guides, you know, obviously, you know, are abiding like everybody else. They buy fewer croaker. Like, it's almost like a, it's not going to be a croaker discussion, but they're just going to buy fewer, you know? Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to get off into the croaker stuff. Everybody pretty well. I know. Knows, I'm just saying, uh, I think just the, the, the odds are that they are, you know? I mean, it, it makes sense. But at the end of the day, catch three, throw them in the cooler if that's what you want to do. But. You know, for a successful yeah. guided trip, you caught fish, you had fun, you released fish. Either way, people's rods got bent. They had a good time. Um, not once last weekend when we were all fishing together, did anybody count how many fish were caught? It was just, you know, did we have fun? Was the was the action consistent? That's what it all boils down to. Yeah. Dean, what are you sipping on there, man? That looks uh, like a brown liquor. It's golden liquor. <laughs> it's ranch. It's ranch um, juice. Ranch juice. <laughs> Man, I'm off the clock, dude. I got a couple days off. So. <laughs> I'm chilling. At, I'm I'm kicking it ranch lifestyle. And we'll take another big swig there because I know you're you you get a little uh you get a little looser uh on oh. some of these topics then we, when you and then we, they might we, piss we off somebody. The, we'll bring the croaker chokers back up again. <laughs> <laughs> Oh Lord! Uh, anybody have anything else on that? Like two years, five years, ten years before we move on? Because well, I, I don't like to dig in. Biologically speaking, what I think I want, what I think we're going to see, okay, all those twenty-inch plus fish are protected. They're going to make more babies. Then we're going to see a, a a group of fish coming up in that first year class that's going to be pretty big, and there's going to be a whole lot of little bitty trout caught, like mm -hmm. what we caught the other day. Yeah. There's going to be a whole lot of that. The you know 10, 12 inch trout. They're going to be all over the place, and you're going to hear a lot of bitching about it. Oh man, all we got is little trout. Well, those little trout came from the big trout, and then mm -hmm. as that year class grows into the next season of their life, then they get into that slot. <clears throat> a certain percentage is going to get taken out. A certain percentage is going to make it past twenty, and now they're protected, and now mm -hmm. they can produce more trout. So, I think the population can't help but go up. I mean, right. that's just just the way it's going to, you know, the way I think it'll play out. But it'll be, you know, before you start seeing a whole bunch of really big trout, it's going to be several years. And, right. and on, on, that, hear a lot of 
on that subject, that. That, right. as, as Scott talks about those things, we have a question that popped up on the trout mortality. If you catch a trout and you handle it quickly and put it back in the water, it is going to survive. I mean, it has a great chance The talk about, oh, every trout that gets released is going to be dead. Not the fact. I mean, it's just a, kind of a myth that has uh, it's kind of got a life of its own somehow. Um, you're going to have fish that get hooked deep, just like the redfish we caught the other day. But I haven't seen a red get hooked like that. You know, one out of what, 100 maybe? Yeah. And so mm -hmm. the fact that the majority of those trout are going back in, the mort mortality rate is going to be the same as it ever was. Just because mm -hmm. they're caught and released, they're not going to die. They hear that, well, it was going to die anyway. You might as well put it in the cooler. Uh, that just doesn't make sense. I mean, if you handle them quickly, get the hook out, back in the water, we're good. Yeah, I was having that conversation with somebody the other day, and I said, well, one sure way to make sure it doesn't survive is to throw it in the cooler. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the odds yeah. go down <laughs> there's there are all kind of studies done the heart institute you know the research folks they did studies on it and very extensive studies they they took trout and basically some of them that were beat all to hell uh from tournaments and getting caught drug around putting a boat putting a live wheel taken to a, a weigh-in released you know weighed released and they had them in cages and they did you know there, it's a pretty interesting study when you read into it and the survival rate was incredibly high and those trout were beat up and so, so they, they might just catch them they, one they handled them so they actually handled in those studies they didn't baby those fish either they treated them like everybody else would they even grabbed some with a towel because mm -hmm. you know there's a lot of speculation that the slime if you affect the slime on them that they get infected so they took those yes they dropped them in the boat they let them flop around on the floor and they did all of those things and then they put them in a pen for a certain amount of time studied them released them and the vast majority of those fish swam away so yeah the mortality rate is it's not going to be any different because we're releasing trout now it, it makes and the only sense. thing i'll add to that is they did indeed hold them up with a boga grip and a monk swiping their slime off with towels and dropping them in boats and stuff. The boga grip mm -hmm. did not kill the fish. Yeah, no, especially the smaller ones. It's not going to. What do you think, the Caleb? You got a question here. Where do you think the next state record is going to come from? Like eventually, they're, we're going to be catching some big old trout, and that's you know half the half the fun here and half the reason we're doing this. But where do you think the next state record or thereabouts? I mean, I've obviously I know the state record is hard to do, but that type of fish. Man, in in, in my mind, you know, there's areas with numbers of big fish. And then there's just areas that have big fish laying around them. So it's kind of hard to forecast that. There could be a 40-inch trout laying in the bottom of East Galveston Bay just as easy as there could in East Matagorda or Baffin mm -hmm. or Mansfield or anywhere else. Uh, you know, there, there's, there's still big fish all in the, up and down the coast. So that, that, that's a tough one. That's a tough one to, uh, to answer. Hell, let's just... Let's just say East Matagorda Bay, because everybody gets real excited when you say that. <laughs> when you say that, hey, by the way, I, Caleb, are you are you ca sorry, sorry, Scott? But uh, while well, while you were talking about that, I know Dean and I uh, down in Aransas and down even further south from us a little bit, and in Rockport, lots and lots and lots of of smaller trout. I mean, you guys experienced that a little bit. They're gonna they're gonna have an explosion at some point. Are you guys experiencing the same thing? I'm sure part of it is freeze, part of it is. Um, other things that have happened here, but lots and lots of smaller trout. From what from what I've been hearing, um, it really hasn't been that way in Matagorda. If for complete honesty, I haven't been to Matagorda in probably two months. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if I sat here and told you everything that happened in Matagorda, somebody's gonna call me out for being full of crap. I've been I've been traveling <laughs> with the camera crew to to video yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. But I have been told yes, in the areas where they're catching a bunch of trout, you're not catching a lot of big ones. I know we are, Dean. We're catching a lot of small fish, but some better ones make well, sense. And so there's, a, there's an interesting way to look at that, too, as well. Where we fish between Rockport, Aransas Pass, and Port Aransas, it has a lot of pressure. There is just a lot of boats. The fact that there are that many people fishing is going to take a toll on the resource. You go 
I mean, and, and I, I'd be interesting to hear from Caleb, but I know he has spent a lot of time down there. I used to fish Matagorda back in the day when it was, I mean, it was back in the eighties and there was no pressure. There was no people. It really wasn't the way it is. Now it's basically a suburb of Houston and there's a lot of people there catching way more fish than they used to. It's kind of a product of, we live in a very touristy area here. We fish in a very touristy area. We're coming up, man. man I mean, 400 boats and trailers <clears throat> launched at Con Brown Harbor. <clears throat> On Saturday, it's probably close to 600. I mean, it is mm. amazing <clears throat> the amount of people that are on that water. So, I mean, it's a product of the environment. There's a mm -hmm. lot of people mm -hmm. catching those fish. So, places that, and so that's what's exciting about the regulations changing, you know even though we're in a touristy area with so much pressure on the water, we're going to start producing larger fish. There's going to be the opportunity, especially for people who, mm -hmm. you know, want to target those and drift and catch and release and throw lures. I mean, there's going to be days where you, you're going to be able to catch a hundred trout and release those fish. Um, so, I mean, it, it's a product of where you're at. So, Caleb, what about Matagorda? Mm -hmm. I mean, has is there more and more people now than there ever was? Man, the way I the way I always explain it is whenever I started fishing Matagorda, which was early to mid two thousands, I could go out on a Wednesday and see six other boats and know four of them, and on a Saturday I could go out and see twelve boats and know ten of them. Mm -hmm. And back back in, and I say it all the time, I caught way more fish, fish back before I really had any idea what I was doing. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was that way. You you could you could walk around one cove and come out with a water trout, water redfish, and a flounder or two. Nothing to it. Uh, five years ago, you could go out in East Matagorda Bay when the birds are working and catch fish to be absolutely sick of it. Um, that has declined in a mm -hmm. rapid fashion as you see more and more boats, and then you add in the weather and and all that kind of good stuff. So, yeah, you know, it 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 has turned into less of a is go out and catch and you've got a good shot at catching a good one to more of a get kind of grindy. And if you catch a bunch of little ones, that's probably a decent day. Yeah. Scott Dean said something that I, I, I want you to, to, to kind of jump in on. He said, you can, we might have a day here where we can go out and catch a hundred trout. Now you Dean and I are old enough to, to have remembered those days. That's kind of where I was headed when we started this discussion. Like, it's not even if even if you're not catching huge trout, which I think eventually is going to come, you're going to catch more numbers of big, big trout. You're going to have days just by again, by default of being able to really, really just walk off the water. I mean, you know, walk off your boat and say, man, that was epic. You know, I think those days are coming. It could happen. I mean, I, I could see it. Um, you know, we there's a lot of other issues like Dean's talked about so many times in the past, water quality, you know, habitat degradation, all those things are, are taking effect as well on our trout population, our fish populations overall, but leaving more in the water can only lead to more fish in the water. I mean, that's, it's pretty damn simple math. <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure this out. You know, you leave more, there's going to be more. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that, that makes me want to jump ahead to, to another part. Cause you talked about degradation and things that are happening to the water. Um, but before we do that, uh, I got, we got a question earlier that I meant to get to who won the casting contest on our, uh, on our trip. I got to tell you not to blow up his head too much, but oh, Caleb can chunk that sucker, man. <laughs> I'm telling you, Bye -bye. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good. I can chunk it out there, especially, you know, those big baits, dude. I want to see. I want to see this. Maybe we can do it at the feeding frenzy. You know what? I'm gonna set up. A, I'm gonna set up a trash can or, or or a big field, and you three guys, if you want to, Scott. But I know Dean keeps saying me, me, me. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe Caleb, we can. Caleb, set up. Was, Caleb was fishing in front of our boat. From his <laughs> <He boat>. was. <laughs> That's what I kept telling John. I'm like, hey, I'm gonna check over there in front of them. <laughs> he's like let's let's see what they're doing over there uh but no okay i gotta tell you man you you go good at, I, i'm not good at the distances i would say 80 90 yards i just send it yeah yeah dean can you can you chunk it 90 yards 100 
<laughs> I feel like but, like Scott Scott is uh, not going to enter this fray. I, I'm not going to get into the over <clears throat> overestimating my cast. Overcompensating. <laughs> oh, it didn't take Taylor, John. Uh, it didn't take hey, Taylor, all I know is that, I can, um, I cast Taylor far enough to catch a that, bunch um, of fish. Well, go ahead, Dean. Caleb was throwing that three ounce bullet. So, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, all I, I, it didn't take Scott long to figure out what I was up to, and he started casting away from me all afternoon. <laughs> oh, no, we were casting at your lure because <clears throat> we were going to cut it off, and yeah, Keep that it. was going to be the end of that. <laughs> we just never got the hook up. I keep about eighty-five yard, yards on my spool, and I could, if if I rear back and send it, I can, I can make myself nervous that if something hits it at the end, it might take take it off of me. So I don't yeah. I don't know how far that is. And I gotta tell you, it was very impressive. And but and whenever I, I show up with when I show up with a ten foot medium medium heavy, <laughs> and a uh, super spook to the casting contest, don't be alarmed. No, here's what here's what I'm gonna do. We're having a team meeting here, right, live on uh, YouTube and on this podcast. I'm going to bring three lures identical and you guys bring your rods. They all have to be same size, six and a half, seven feet, whatever. And then let's go. Let's go. I'll bring the lures. I'll bring all three. Uh, is, this spin, is this spinning rods or bait casters? Whatever you want. <laughs> you can bring any rod that you that you cast in the bay. Hey, but I, I'm bringing the lures. I'm bringing the I, lures. I, I, He's going to show up with a spinning rod with five pound line on it. Exactly. Well, that's, that's up to you. Hey, man. No, no, that's up to you. I'm, I'm just working. I just want to know what the parameters are so I can work within them. I'm gonna go. But find, we're not gonna have any. I'm gonna go find go one ahead. of the beach YouTubers and the, and learn that little spinny, spinny figure eight whoosh thing. Yeah. <laughs> y'all are gonna get. Y'all are gonna get. You know, throwing your casting contest and start chunking those lures. I'm gonna get the exact same lure, and I'm gonna put it in one of those bait launchers they use on the surf. <laughs> Show up with a potato cannon. <laughs> that's my rod. That's my rod. Yeah, that that thing. Um, okay, so let's jump ahead because Scott mentioned this, and this is a question that we've had on the on the rundown for I want to say three or four weeks. Never got to, um, and we're going to get into some some other fishing stuff here in a second. But uh, it's a question from a listener that, that wants to know what a D cell plant is and how it affects fishing. Quote: uh, Do you know if there are any impact studies to the effects of a desal desalination? By the way, plant in the area and what it would mean for our bays and fishing. I know the plants have been in uh, talks for a while, but I haven't heard anything on the impacts. I specifically mean in our area and not uh, systems elsewhere. Now, Dean, I'm going to start with you here because I know that's something that's going on right now down there. And so what area did that question come from? Because yes, it is in the conversation every day in my area. It's on the news. There's permits, there's proposals. The Port of Corpus Christi is booming and do you know where that question came from? I do oh. not. Uh, you just said that and I didn't get it. Okay. And there aren't, so there's only, I, I think in the United States, there's only two desal plants. One's in California, one's in Florida. They're over in um, Saudi Arabia and they're over in that part of the world. Um, huge mega desal plants. So I don't know about if there's actually been environmental mm -hmm. studies. There's nothing to compare it to here. There's certainly nothing to compare it to in the Gulf of Mexico. But what it does do is it sucks in hundreds of millions of gallons of water per day. And the way the thing works is it turns it into steam. And the steam that comes off the salt water is the fresh water that's used. And then what's left over, the brine, <clears throat> the concentrated salt goes back in the bay. The people that I've talked to that are familiar with the process, there was a lot of conversation in the beginning that they're putting all this salt back in the water and this concentrated stuff. Well, the salt that they're putting back in the water was there in the first place. So that's not the biggest issue. The biggest issue is that whenever it draws in hundreds of millions of gallons of water, it brings in the larvae. Every single little tiny creature that goes into that intake, it comes out sterile on the other end. Nothing survives the process um whether there are filters whether there are ways to i mean i don't know that there's many questions to be answered on the environmental impacts of that corpus christi around the harbor island area around the inner port area there are five or six permits that have been applied for there is the city council in corpus christi actually approved like a test 
um, plant that they were going to build. Mm -hmm. And it was a ridiculous amount of money. It was like $700 million just for the experiment. Jeez. So the citizens of Corpus Christi are quite upset right now about the money that's being spent on an experiment to find out if it's feasible. And right now, I mean, there are government, there's bonds, there's um, assistance in paying for that, but it is still falling a huge price on the citizens of Corpus Christi. And it is the future. There is much to be decided about that. Um, there's a lot of places for people to voice their opinion, to send letters and comment on that. Um, but, What's your opinion on it, though? Because oh, like hey, Caleb I and mean, I, I, Caleb, well, I hate to speak for you, but I don't think you and I have a lot to add to this. Yeah. I know Scott might, but uh, well, like, what's in, your opinion? In, Do you? In, I'm not in. Of course, I'm opposed to it. I mean, I, I hate to see whatever's going to happen to the uh, detrimental effects to the bay and the bay systems of sucking all of these larvae and all these things into it. But we live in a very arid part of Texas. We live on the edge of the desert. There is no water. The lakes are constantly below 30%. We're under water restrictions right now. So the argument for it is tough to beat. I mean, there's a lot of people that, I mean, you can't, there's no counterpoint. It's like, yeah, we got no water. We got more mm -hmm. people and we get less and less water every day. So uh, it is inevitable that it's going to happen in the future where they actually put the intake is a big question. You know, they, there's options of putting the intake way offshore to put a pipe several miles offshore and draw it in from the Gulf opposed to drawing it from the Bay. And then where they put the discharge, but then it becomes very, very expensive to, for those options. And there's, there's arguments every day. And I'll link up some of the stuff on the, on the Facebook page. I mean, I get the emails. We have groups here that are local that stay up to date on the current permitting issues and, and such as that. So I'll try to link it up and, and help people gather a little more knowledge on that yeah i'm completely ignorant on it but scott i'm gonna let you jump in it looks like caleb actually has an opinion on this as well but uh scott jump in if you have anything to add another level here i really haven't gotten up to speed on them a whole lot i just know you know plants require a lot of water you know we got another situation going on here you know in port lavaca port o'connor with with our plant over here wanting to expand and they're going to build a new lake and take water out of the Lavaca river and we don't have that much fresh water inflow into our bays. And that's all, that's been a big problem with the rebuilding of marshes and the degradation of the habitat is, mm -hmm. you know, our, our bay systems are set up their estuaries and they require some fresh water to come into them. And a whole lot of the, the smaller fish, the larvae and all that, they require some fresh water they they don't do well in high salinities and uh i don't know i think our bays are just going to start getting more and more you know higher salinity because we're pulling all the water si siphoning it off before it ever gets a chance to get there mm -hmm. uh, i'm really glad that, that that scott and dean said what they said and and described it pretty well how i would have being as how whenever i read the rundown i thought that you had <clears throat> spelt tractor fuel plants incorrectly <laughs> <laughs> I told I you you and I, I didn't have anything to add. I, I wasn't even going to pretend. No, <laughs> Desal, didn't they use that in Vietnam? Yeah, no, I think that was something else. <laughs> I mean, I one way to look at it, too, a whole lot of that over in the Middle East, Dubai and all that, they're doing a lot of the desal work over there. Mm -hmm. It'd be interesting to see what their results are. Mm -hmm. But it would also be very hard to get true results from over there i would imagine yeah I, I think that the government over there might skew things just a little bit mm -hmm. caleb and i were thinking about napalm plants uh, yeah from it, Vietnam. It, <laughs> napalm trees caleb's like napalm. i'm all for more diesel plants yeah it, yeah is, is, is napalm bad down? for the bay yeah i think it is yeah i think but napalm is not a good thing for trout fishing uh, i'm pretty sure it is especially if you're on the boat when they drop it okay <laughs> <laughs> that could sting a little bit. You may need some sunblock. Um, oh, speaking of, uh, of Vietnam, by the way, uh, I do want to kind of uh, uh, do a little uh, shout out and uh, and a uh, 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 request 
from everybody listening to this podcast, everybody on the group page about the carry the load um, event on Memorial Day. Uh, I'm on Camille Knoll's team, Scott's uh, better half. And uh, I'm asking that uh, everybody, I actually sent an email to the people over at my radio station and hopefully we're going to have, uh, you know, some, some involvement there. But uh, it's at 7 a.m. The walk. Make sure you go to the East Coast Relay. I think it's what it's called. And uh, join the team. I'll be there. My whole family's going to be walking. It's just about three miles. And uh, you can see the link. I, I put one on uh, the group page this morning. Uh, and it's it's a really good deal. I'm trying to trying to really quadruple uh, our attendance uh, from last year. So uh, I'm actually glad you brought up napalm and uh, Vietnam, Caleb. <laughs> Something, you're welcome. something else on that our uh, our boy uh, john park off sent a mm-hmm. whole bunch of those uh little lure trays or taco trays as uh dean likes to call them but uh he sent a whole bunch of big box full of them over here to the house just came in today and uh, he wants camille to use those as fundraiser for the uh for the walk and oh, nice. so i don't i don't remember how many that were in there i, I kind of glanced at it while ago it looked like i don't know 15 or 20 mm-hmm. something like that are in there so we're working on something make a donation get a get yeah. a bite me lure tray taco tray pretty sweet it is. They're, they're, they're pretty dang sweet all right caleb uh we'll start with you on this one uh, another uh, question from our listener uh one of our listeners here uh wants an explanation of the artificial lure bites and why they can be different uh and here's the question itself i'm having a hard time picking up this bite throwing artificials oh by the way he's new to art- artificials he listens to the podcast and said you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna go all in which which i love that and try to you know start throwing artificials more less bait all that stuff so he said uh, i'm having a hard time picking up this bite throwing artificials i'm trying to use artificial more than live bait these days uh, but i'm having difficulty learning when i'm just hitting some grass bottom uh and versus when i'm getting a bite and the bites are different which we've experienced uh, in the last month or so. You always talk about a thump, but maybe you can get into some of the detail on feeling a bite using artificial. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to toss it to you because I've got some thoughts, but uh, I'd rather let you, you you tell them. Well, after watching John Fish, the secret is you just set the hook every dang time. <laughs> it doesn't cost you a nickel. <laughs> hook sets you three, and sometimes, sometimes it pulls back. doesn't cost you uh, one, one nickel. The, the, the to, to to be clear, the thump is like the the best part of the roller coaster. They're not not all of them are thumps. Sometimes the tick, sometimes it gets heavy, sometimes it's a little whack. But you'll learn to tell the difference. Um, if you're not already, I would really suggest using braid and a and a good rod. You can you can tell a lot of differences with that. It's a lot more sensitive. But uh, yeah, man, the thing is, you're ahead of the game though. If if, if you can fill it on grass or something, then you're going to be able to fill the bites when they're lighter. Mm-hmm. But it's it's repetition and just doing it over and over and over. And um, I don't set the hook when I feel grass, but I promise you I reel down and, and that next twitch is just a little bit harder just to make sure it wasn't a fish. So mm-hmm. if you're feeling all the little things, then I think you're well on the track to becoming an artificial aficionado. I did almost take your eye out once. You did. The gel coat on the side of your boat's probably a little <laughs> beat up over there too. It always is. <laughs> Doesn't cost me a nickel. So, so actually, um, I think- uh, Caleb just just coined a new word, artificionado. Artificionado. Put that in like the dictionary. <laughs> We're going to put that on a T-shirt, but it has to be a triple XL. <laughs> yeah, Dean. You know what I would have told him is just something different. Uh, when something different happens at the end of your line, and it's not the the, the drag of uh oyster shell which you you can kind of get used to or grass which you can kind of feel just kind of a heavier weight but it either picks it up it moves it what what caleb was talking about but it's just it's well, really it's, just it's trial and error second it's that second pulse that you mm-hmm. get i mean of course where we're at you set the hook on every blade of grass that hits the hook you know but you That's learn you, to caleb. you learn to resist the urge Air. i mean you <laughs> the more you do it you you get the feeling when it is grass and when it's actually a fish, but when it takes the grass or it ticks something, you know, you give it that tug and then it's going to be the second pulse that gets it whenever mm-hmm. the rod goes down a little bit. So, um, I mean, it, it practice makes perfect. It is a skill that you have to, to, uh, you have something to compare it to is the best yeah. way to explain that. 
you know, and the other thing, Scott, about this is uh, just more time on the water, more time throwing artificials. And you've said this numerous times, which I wanted to get your your thought on it. Um, you know, throw it when you know there's fish there, right? And then you can kind of get a better sense and kind of get ahead of the curve. Yeah, I mean, if you're a, a bait fisherman and you're catching some fish and you want to transition to being an artificial guy, that's the best time. You know, you've, you've been catching your fish on some bait. You know you're in a good spot. You know you got some feeding fish. Then pull out the artificial and start trying it. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you're still in that mode of, I can't figure this out. Uh, I can tell you from being on the platform and watching... Yeah, I watch the lure and I watch the fish and I see the two connect all the time. And I cannot tell you how often it was probably, I don't know. It's, it's probably at least 75, 80% of the time I see mm -hmm. the bite. The lure is missing. It's gone. It's in their mouth and the angler still hasn't felt it. And I'm telling them he ate it, he yeah. ate it. And then they feel it. It, so I don't know. It's, it's one of those weird things of, you know, you see it happen over and over and over again. And I'm watching the rod and I'm watching them. I'm watching the fish and the rod doesn't react all the time. And I'll, you know, I'll see the fish eat it. I know he's got it in his mouth, but mm -hmm. there's always this little delay. And, you know, it's transmitting up the line as soon as it happens. I mean, you've got a direct connection, but there's something in there. I think sometimes we don't feel it until they've got it almost to their crushers you know yeah. that initial when they suck it in that's that little you know we all talk about a subtle bite i think that's the subtle bite is when they suck it in and then when they turn is when people feel it it's what 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 kind of bite would you describe watching it get white watered go underwater and then i'm for the people that aren't watching i'm making air bunny ears here hits the top water like a train underwater <laughs> i i was thinking the same thing but i was just gonna let it slide. but the conclusion to that is there's variety in those i mean none of the you can't say that this is how they're eating today yeah some mm -hmm. days man that redfish will come from 10 feet away man you see the weight coming boom and then some days you throw it on their nose and they just kind of pick it up and yeah and then some days they inhale it to their gullet and then you still don't set the hook under the water yeah. <laughs> it's the only way in the world to catch a redfish and somehow have dean still catch a hardhead <laughs> <laughs> and that's what we call the long game <laughs> the long game i'll tell you what scott but uh, caleb was on my bo boat and he and he saw you he saw that that fish eat your your top water and he says uh, oh i know i know it's in his mouth and then he said I know it's in his throat. Why didn't he set the hook stomach. yet? Why is he not set the hook? I know it's in his lower intestine. No. I, I know it's... <laughs> that was, that was absolutely zero pressure on the rod. I mean, I, I did what I always do. As soon as it sucked it like that and it went okay, underwater, I started I, pulling I, back I, with the rod and there's no pressure. I got in here. I, I, I got Because I saw the whole thing. I, I had a front row. I had a front row seat to the melee that ensued. When that fish hit... And when I talk about the variety of weight things that that fish hit. And when Scott set the hook, the fish was probably 20 feet from where the explosion was. So it brought it kind of at an angle to the boat and you just can't feel that fish in Scott's defense, which I'm morally opposed to coming to Scott's <laughs> defense on most occasions, <laughs> but that fish came to us. And so Whenever he set the hook, I mean, so he was fishing off the front of the boat and hooked the fish very much in front of us. And then when the thing came tight, it was at the back of the boat. That's so crazy. the fish made a run in an odd direction. And that's in Scott's defense. Okay. I'm well, so, sorry, so I'm sorry from, Caleb. I from, our, from our boat, we saw the fish blow up and I'm sitting there like, why don't you send the hook? Why don't you send the hook? And then I moved right around to reminding michelle how hot it was and what good content we could get with the chicken and bikini <laughs> and then we talked to we cast the idea of the content and then i turned around and i see scott reel down and set the hook that was the <laughs> timeline on our boat <laughs> yeah the thing is i know scott's right it's just more fun this way <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and, and actually as we were sitting there 
I ate a taco before he said the hook. I mean, I unwrapped it. Right, right out of Park Off Taco Truck. blew tray. up. I picked the taco out of my what I want to know is from the tray off. What the I want to know is why were y'all all watching me fish, trying to learn something? Oh, we, were already, we were already hooked up. We were, <laughs> we were wondering if John was going to hit you already and throw it up to it. <laughs> yeah. I was like, look, you just I, caught a fish. Let's go over there. Let's go. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm fishing one day, and I've got a guy in the front of the boat, and he flips out under a dock, and we're trying to catch a flounder for a tournament. He flips under a dock, and I flip out, and I catch a, a trout, and I'm fishing out of the back of the boat, and the, the, the boat is pointing at the dock. I could not be any further away from the dock. And so I catch the trout, and I get it in. I take it off. I'm bent over in the water washing my hands, and I, I see a flounder swim by me, and I'm looking at this flounder. I was like, damn. There's a flounder right there. And then I look a little bit harder. I was like, there is a fishing line hanging out of his mouth. <laughs> and I looked at the front of the boat and my dude just standing there, just twitching. <laughs> and I was like, dude, set the hook. And he looks at me like I've lost my damn mind. And I start yelling at him real down to set the hook. And he reels down and says the hook. And the flounder that had ate the lure 30 yards in front of the boat swam past me and the motor on the back of the boat without dude on the front ever having any clue it happened. <laughs> <laughs> so who got credit for the fish? Yeah. Uh, he caught the fish, but that was about seven years ago, and I ain't stopped talking about it yet. Yeah. Something else yeah. that was that was crazy. Y'all didn't see it, but um, Ashworth was standing next to me when I did it. I caught one of those little dink trout, you know, at the end there when we were catching a bunch of those little small ones. I mm -hmm. caught this little dink trout, and I had my rod up underneath my elbow, you know, under my armpit, and so my lure was kind of hanging down in the water. And I took that little trout and I threw it back in the water. He hit the water. This will tell you about catch and release he hit the water and spun around and took a shot at the lure again <laughs> the released fish yeah that is one the released fish, fish. <laughs> that is one I, dumb fish. mike and i both looked at him and said man as soon as he hits 15 he's done yeah. <laughs> when, when that See, john, fish gets legal length <laughs> he's over it's over <laughs> that's the one john's gonna catch yeah found yeah him. exactly <laughs> Uh, you were telling him, take a good look at that ice chest, buddy, because it's you're gonna see it again. <laughs> yeah. see that. I could not believe it. Mike that. looked, Mike stopped, he looked at me, he said, Did you see that? I said, Yeah, just couldn't believe it either. <laughs> oh man, this is this is too good. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, we're not gonna get to your tarpon topic yet. yet. Uh, Scott, I keep kicking it down the road because we're not in season yet, anyway. Yeah, it ain't, and it ain't tarpon season yet. Yeah, it ain't tarpon, so I'm kicking it down the road. And, and uh, where to fish uh, when wind direction changes, we'll get to that one next week as well. Uh, but I know um, we, we've got to get to what would Scott do, what would Caleb do, what would Dean do, and just kind of pulling the curtain back. Uh, one of the things I love about these guys is being able to add some levels to each topic. So there's always going to be some extra. They don't just all say the same thing. Um, and so keep keep sending your questions, and uh, we'll keep answering them, and we'll always get to them. In fact, I got a question right here as I was sitting here uh, for maybe next week's uh, podcast uh, from from one of our listeners. Um, but uh, it, it's it's Easter weekend. Uh, I don't think that's quite. Correct me if I'm wrong, Dean, but I don't think that's quite as uh, busy a holday because it's, no, it's a family a holiday. Of, yeah, that's a family oriented one. But um, I'm fishing this weekend. I mean, I'm here at the ranch for a couple of days, but I'm fishing Friday, Saturday, and then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So, I mean, it, get them drifts, town, get yeah. them drift socks, and and you know, we got to get through April before we get to tarpon fishing and kingfish and jacks and stuff like that. Um, so April, yeah, I was looking at the forecast. I mean, we got uh, the first week of April. It looks like what you expect in April: a lot of south wind, changing directions. It's kind of coolish this morning, you know, mm -hmm. but hot in the afternoon but i mean tide is up the one thing that we have in my neighborhood that i love in the windy season is a really high tide because we get back in the corners we get back in the bushes you have a lot more flats to explore and you can i mean we have a lot of wide open flats so the wind can be savage on us but during the one thing that bells you out on that is a really high tide. It lets you get into a few spots that aren't as savage as others. And we've been pinned down. I mean, so you've been down there fishing. We've been fishing. We've been pinned on the deeper flats. The tide yeah. has not come in to let us get out of certain areas that we've 
I mean, I, I kind of feel like I've been stuck lately. I'm ready for a change of pace. I'm ready for some more water and bring on the wind if it has to be that way. But that big south wind pushes water onto the flats. It, it, it brings the water in. So, But we're, we're past the cold fronts. The water's good. The temperature's good. Top water bite. I mean, we caught all our fish on top waters with the guys um, for our little feeding frenzy thing. And it's the April is where things really start to shift gears, but there's going to be a few challenges before it really shifts gears. And Scott, I, I cannot tell you, um, I thought you hated April. Uh, I, I got Dean on a tangent about April <laughs> when we were fishing. <laughs> and, and Friday, Friday is one of the biggest reasons why Scott, I'm looking at 25 to 35 on Friday yeah. yep. and when windy Saturday and Sunday, but, uh, you you could probably get somewhere, uh, maybe maybe Sunday <laughs> Sunday morning get somewhere. Or, you can get somewhere. You can go to the ranch. Uh, but what are you looking at, buddy? Uh, water's coming up, like Dean said, and our tide's running about a foot above what it's supposed to right now. Even with the northwest wind, northwest knocked it down a little bit. It was blowing mm -hmm. like hell last night and this morning. Uh, so it knocked it down some, but it's still higher than predicted, and that's going to be a trend uh probably all the way through the weekend that super strong southeast wind on friday is going to push that water way up so i would start venturing further and further back into the back lakes um uh, if i had to guess you know the pringle conti all that type of stuff around here is going to turn on with the uh, higher water and everything getting back back to normal as far mm -hmm. as the tide levels go uh mm -hmm. so with the wind, it's kind of nice to be able to get back into those little back pockets and little small lakes. I like the the little unnamed ones. Everybody goes to Pringle Conti, yeah, yeah. And all the the named lakes, but uh, I go to the little satellites off of them, and the fish will push way the hell back in there when this water gets up like this. That's your language, Caleb. Getting back in some of those places that aren't on the map. Yeah, what the guy said. Tides are coming up. Um, get up on the flats that you haven't been able to get up to. Get in some back lakes. Check it out. Uh, mm -hmm. Send me any kind of information you have because I'm interested. I don't get to fish this weekend. It's like like Dean said, family family weekend, and I like my family, so I'm gonna go do that. Mm -hmm. But uh, but yeah, no, it could it could be rewarding getting into some of those little little lakes and back corners of the base. Well, all right, everybody, uh, have a happy uh, happy Easter, um, and maybe lead some fish on Good Friday. That's our tradition. Uh, and, and have a great week. Uh, after that, we are going to be back with you on Tuesday and we do have a lot of stuff percolating for our listeners, man. We're, we're planning on a little feeding frenzy discussion. We're, uh, planning on, uh, maybe, maybe some stuff that's going to be on, uh, uh, mainstream TV occasionally. We're working on that. So, uh, appreciate everybody hanging in and, uh, subscribing to the YouTube channel. And, uh, certainly, uh, most important, I always say is subscribing to the, um, uh, to the podcast itself, wherever you get your podcast before we get out of here, Scott. I could have had fish on Good Friday. You know, I mean, I had a redfish that we kept, you know, Dean cleaned. Mm -hmm. And uh, not only did I lose a lure out of that, I lost the, the fillets. He didn't even give me the damn fillets. The fillets? Off yeah, he didn't even give me the fillets off of it. I didn't hey, think about it until I was about halfway back home. I was like, damn. Yeah, check if, the cooler, man. I lost a lure and the fillets. Better, <laughs> if, if it makes you feel better. I brought them with me to the ranch, so I'm good. All right, good. They're going to they're going to a good yeah, cause. Yeah, that makes me feel all better. <laughs> they're going, they're going to, to a, a good, good cause. cause. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> feed, oh man, feed my family. Yeah, yeah. You uh -huh. got to feed your family. You got to feed your family. All right, boys. Appreciate it, man. That was a lot of fun, and uh, we're gonna have uh, we already have topics for next week. Uh, you all have a great uh, holiday, uh, and if you do get out there, be safe. It's gonna be real, real windy. Uh, catch them up, and we will talk to you guys next time. Yeah, Dean, you're going to have to have four bags.